Alright, there we go. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's fucking me. Video number 100 today. Not counting ones I've deleted. It don't matter, though. They said it couldn't be done. I said it couldn't be done in the mirror. But we made it. 100 videos. 100 years. A thousand years. Videos. One thousand years. That's how long this channel lasts. Or until they delete my account. Or I... Mizuna Falls is a Japanese proto real-time open-world Twin Peaks-like James Hurley spin-off adventure game that was developed and published by Human Entertainment on the Sony PlayStation in 1998. The game was notable for its clear, unabashed reverence for the work of David Lynch, as well as other American films of the era, and for being one of the earliest experiments in fully 3D open-world game design on home consoles, predating and likely inspiring games like Shenmue and Deadly Premonition. But it remained relatively unknown outside of Japan for about 20 years until someone going by the name Resident Evie began work on an English translation patch. Themselves driven by the esoteric nature of a game that sounds mechanically significant on paper, was inspired by Twin Peaks, emerging at the height of Japan's ardent fascination with Twin Peaks, yet hardly maintained a footprint online. This endeavor would finally kick over the rock set atop this weird insect that had hardly seen the cruel light of day in decades. It's all like, uh, pale and alien looking and then it skitters off and then uh, maybe spread some kind of prehistoric virus that the X-Files can investigate. Getting worse at analogies, I'm finding. Though Evie had considered their work on the project done once they had translated and posted the game's script, an independent game developer named Gemini would offer to hack the game's ROM and implement the English text into a playable version of the game. Since then, Emula- mm purchasing the game from your local retailer has become relatively easy, and some sparse details about its production have been made available. It began life as a greatly scaled down concept, but still ambitious for the hardware they'd been working with. The idea was essentially a clue-style murder mystery where ten characters are confined into a spooky mansion, and the protagonist tries to out one of the others as the murderer. The twist was that it would be real time, with each of the characters going about their own pre-programmed activities. After working on the Super Nintendo game Fireman in 1994, Mizerna Falls' project director, Taichi Ishizuka, fulfilled his dream of a road trip across North America, a dream fueled by his teenage love of American films and music. So, returning with a great deal of experience and reference material, Ishizuka and a team of 12 would eventually widen the scope of this idea to encompass an entire town in rural America. Though one, like a lot of games at the time, filtered through the uncanny lens of film, contributing to the surreal, off-kilter Americana scene in in many games from the original PlayStation, like Metal Gear Solid and Silent Hill. Over the span of 12 months, Mizerna Falls, which quickly proved far too advanced for the PlayStation, had several significant ideas and mechanics either omitted entirely or left in an incomplete state. This also led to a number of glaring bugs and performance issues that they were aware of on launch, but there simply was no helping before the release date. Fixing any of them would have taken substantial reworking of the entire game, so it was decided that they'd rather just have a game show on time. Love being reminded that it's just always been this way. I'm not familiar with any method of determining how this game sold or how it was received. The wiki provides a dead link to a Famitsu review that apparently gave it a 22 out of 40, but that's hardly enough data for me to draw a conclusion. For all I know, that could be the sole dissenting opinion, and this is actually the best fucking game ever made. It's like this Japanese version of a... Uh... I don't fucking know. Despite producing a number of unique and memorable games like Clock Tower and Twilight Syndrome, Human Entertainment went bankrupt a year or so later, so I'm guessing Mizerna Falls probably wasn't the flagship they were hoping for. It being one of, if not the last game Human would develop before splitting into several different studios, one of which being Suda51's Grasshopper Manufacture. The game's elusive director pioneered this ambitious oddity that may have left ripples across Japanese game design and then just left the business entirely, and of all things, to become a hiking tour guide in the Canadian Rockies, researching for that great video game called Life, one that, like Mizerna Falls, 
is big and in real time, but often hollow and filled with sparse few moments of joy. Like Deadly Premonition, Mazurna Falls is a game that wears its influence on its sleeve, in some ways matching its cannibalization of David Lynch's work, and in other ways choosing to focus on very different aspects of that work, opting for the other side of the murder mystery supernatural thriller coin. So for now I'm not going to get caught up pointing out the numerous ways these things overlap and try to focus on the game's narrative, which structurally derivative as it may be, is rather unique and occasionally well written, especially considering it's from an era that didn't entirely require that. This this is the sort of game that could have sold itself entirely on the novelty of its gameplay, but its story winds up being the most compelling and well-realized part of it. But I will admit the completely unprompted neurotic impulse to pet Rodriguez, uh, the main character's dog, every single time I passed by him does hint at some greater primordial power at the core of Mazurna's gameplay that I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to confront. Mazurna Falls is a quiet, idyllic town of less than 2,000 people at the base of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, or Coralado, depending on who you ask. On Christmas Day, 1998, two days after the real-world release of the game, a 16-year-old girl named Kathy is found unconscious, barely clinging to life with wounds that suggest she was mauled by a bear. Shortly after, another girl named Emma is reported missing by her parents. Our protagonist, Matthew, is a friend and classmate of Emma, and perhaps more. But she was always too much of an enigma, a closed book, to explore such things. The bumbling local police deduce that both the bear attack on Kathy and Emma's disappearance are likely connected, so they make the rounds asking everyone, Matthew especially, as he was one of the last people to see her last night. Sheriff Morgan plans to take Matthew down to the station for questioning when a call comes in that Kathy has regained consciousness, so the two head there instead. We meet a few more characters at the hospital, like Kathy's father, a well-liked but obnoxious priest named Father Barton, who adopted Kathy and raised her to be his little acolyte, which she was often teased for and called a Jesus freak. Also James, a psychiatrist and Native American history expert, who has been privately meeting with Emma prior to her disappearance and has decent insight to her state of mind. For the time Kathy is awake, she is catatonic. That is until her father enters and her vitals spike, causing her weakened body to just give out and die suddenly. On the way out of the hospital, James asks for Matthew's help figuring out what happened to Emma, believing that, based on their discussions, whatever happened to her was in some way supernatural. In the days leading up to her disappearance, she had reoccurring dreams of some kind of heavenly plane and awoke with an intense feeling of disassociation, doubting the reality of her own existence and questioning the point of carrying on when life is really just a mask over something more significant. For a while, Matthew attempts to play kid detective, easily sneaking around the unconscious competent cops with the occasional help of Winona, Emma's best friend who wants to find her just as much as Matthew. Like Twin Peaks, Mazurna Falls has you crossing paths with a lot of smaller recurring characters in the pursuit of answers and in doing so uncovering the town's dark underbelly. The other person to see Emma last was Mel, a local sh kid, a uh, well-known face and notorious Mel's just an obvious bad seed, and is clearly hiding how much he knows about the previous night's events. Often, the only way Matthew can get answers out of him is to ask his poor, deluded girlfriend, Lorraine. Thankfully, much of this game is spent just beating the shit out of him, as he does seem to get mixed up in just about every slimy part of Mazurna Falls we delve into, like a one-man team rocket. You again! I'm gonna kick your fucking ass! At a town meeting that Matthew eavesdrops on, the police theorize the two girls were together in the nearby forest when they were attacked by a bear that had become particularly aggressive due to his inability to hibernate. Which has gotta be tough. I know I've been in that situation where you, you got work in the morning, but they're throwing some kind of hoot nanny downstairs. The only problem with this theory is that there's no sign of Emma being attacked, and Kathy had other wounds not characteristic of an animal attack, like bruising around the neck that suggests strangulation. It is important to note that by the nature of the gameplay, there may be large amounts of story details or scenes that you just don't make it in time to see over the course of the seven in-game days this game takes place during. If you're not there to witness something, then it just kind of happens without you. Missing at least two specific scenes will result in what is referred to as the 
bad ending, but even those usually tie up the story. This is more like playing for 16 hours and then being told you did it wrong, please try again. This is the curse that comes with the blessing of such a complex story being told in this format, and I guess in a, in a game that was not entirely finished. It's honestly still impressive how many characters and plot threads are being juggled and how they all come together. I mean, obviously they had other media acting as a guide, but there are so few sort of straightforward murder mystery games, and it's sort of surreal seeing one on such an early console. But the difficulty and ambiguous design is a huge impediment to enjoying that story, and even the game's creator knew that, and he did not intend it to wind up that way. Which is why you're not going to hear me judging you for using a walkthrough, using cheats and save states, not paying for a copy of the original game, not paying for other games, stealing games. Uh, if you have any interest in pursuing your own playthrough and not having the rest of the story spoiled, feel free to skip to this time. If the process of uh, downloading hacks for ROMs and uh, fucking with BIOSes sounds like a hassle that you'll uh, say you'll get around to, stick around for the next bit, but I'll give you a moment to make up your mind. Also, I sense I'll probably spoil a great deal of Twin Peaks, but I'll try to contain that into one section so you can skip through that as well. Also, if you look to the right, you'll probably see a bunch of other videos I, that you could watch that I didn't make. So maybe you'd like maybe maybe you'd like that. Maybe you'd like to not watch this at all. Maybe you'd like to watch one of those videos that you already watched that YouTube just really likes to constantly remind you exists. I already figured out why Fallout New Vegas is genius, and here's why. I already learned about Eternal Darkness, the greatest Lovecraft game nobody played. And there's that Dark Wave mixtape that I will never click on just out of principle. I don't trust other people to make me a mixtape. Anyways, as you can see, I too am on the internet. Can I help you? Need to get out. Okay, how about you start with your name, partner? I'm... I'm dying. I'm dead. I think I died. Well, that's a funny name. I, I think you might have the wrong number. My Sharon. There's no Sharon here, just me and a couple cans of Kickstart, and I hate Sharon those. <laughs> Boy, so you like that a long time ago, or? What's that? Tell me about yourself. Oh, not much to tell. I feel like life was just beginning for me. Ah, taken before your time. What was your time? You, you sound exceptionally old-timey. 2009. Oh well, that, that does surprise me. So you're just like, putting on a uh... Putting on? You know, like a Monster Mash voice. <laughs> I guess he did sort of talk like this. <laughs> In the early stages of the investigation, it becomes more and more clear that Matthew and Winona's friend Emma had a whole second life that they barely knew about. There does turn out to be an angry bear on the loose, but there are too many other new clues concerning the crime scene, and it's most likely the bear only interrupted some other sinister activity. Kathy was found by a park ranger named Cohen, who claims the way in which she was positioned in front of a particularly large tree and the fact that there was a ring of fire around her seems to imply she was involved in some kind of occult activity. Those two things, by the way, you, you stand to put those in the report. Something about them, feel like we're gonna come back around to it, I don't know. But that's never really put on the record as it's just his hunch and because Morgan and the Mizerna Falls Police Department are all completely incompetent and constantly outdone by a high school sleuth with nothing to lose, I think. I, I don't actually know him all that well. He seems to be wearing a Letterman jacket, but never mentions taking part in some kind of sport. This might just be one of those things, you know, they just copied because of the aesthetic without knowing what it represents. Because Mike wears one, but he's like, like a wrestler, and they show him wrestling. I don't know. It's probably a bit too early in the video for me to be dissecting something so trivial. I just need one more detail about this dude to be on board with him as the protagonist. Oh hey, what's up Hudson? Oh. Speaking of trivial grievances, I just noticed this game takes place during Christmas, and, th and there's zero Christmas decorations. You'd, you'd be seeing those for like a week after Christmas. Months if you're anything like me. Gotta get a jump on the next year. Christmas baby, fuck. Uh, the other clue that turns up 
once you have a fatal DDR battle with a bear is a Native American necklace that is caught in its claws. Emma's mother, Sarah, has been an emotional wreck since her daughter disappeared, but Matthew is able to convince her to let him investigate her room for clues, finding a strange ring, which the bartender at the local bar confirms bears the insignia of a gang and the key to her locker at school. Since they're on break, the school is closed, so that leads kind of dead for now. Matthew returns to Emma's mother empty-handed, right as Mel speeds off on his motorcycle, and she starts screaming that somebody was in Emma's room and stole her diary. Super Detective Morgan just gaslights her about it. Look, you're going through a lot right now. Is that Mel? So I got my pirate's booty here. I expect this to run long. Much like Emma, there are a few hints that Kathy was also attempting to lead a hidden life of rebellion, signing up for some kind of Wiccan group at her school, mostly to upset her satanically panicked father. And as it turns out, she was the owner of the necklace found with the bear. Could have fooled me, it looked really good on that bear. But you know what? There's a reason I didn't insert a joke there, that's fine. So clearly, she was dabbling with other forms of spirituality. Matthew manages to track down Mel, who is secretly meeting with a gang member named Bonehead, who is trying to collect some money they both seem to owe to some intimidating third party. This is kind of like the sweet spot. You really start to see all these avenues of mystery open up, and it's just routinely wild that this game was made. I think more than copying bits of Twin Peaks, which it does do an awful lot, it also just gets the format of the show. There are a ton of moments where it's not a direct copy of a scene, but you can absolutely buy that. Well, that might be a scene in some made-up episode. Matthew and Winona lie their way into the school and find a camera and a floppy disk inside Emma's locker. The former contains only one photo of a cave entrance in the forest, and the latter... It contains a MIDI recording that can be played back through a keyboard, and it doesn't sound like hamster dance, it sounds like this. Sarah explains that this song is called Eternal, and Emma played it all the time. Interestingly enough, Isabella, the singer at Bar Wolves, is known for singing that very song. I need to do some deep thinking. I'll be in my office for a while. The diner is robbed by two masked men, while Morgan stares ahead blankly, forgetting he's a police officer with a gun in the midst of his pre-burger delirium. After they escape, Lorraine all but confesses for Mel and explains that he roped her into this heist, and it's not long before he's picked up and held in jail. Matthew takes the opportunity to snoop around his place, finding of course Emma's diary. It's here that Morgan realizes they just can't stop Matthew from solving this case on their watch, and he decides to make him an honorary deputy, uh, which amusingly Matthew Matthew only ever has to prove once to a cop that I guess wasn't informed of this little arrangement. And he's just like, So you got a badge, big whoop, I got a badge. How about you tell your story, walking bozo? Of note in Emma's diary are two entries, one implying Isabella is under the control of someone described only as that man, and another written on the night of her disappearance, describing her and Kathy's plan to meet up with Mel at a motel for something Kathy needed, but Emma wanted no part in. Kathy checked herself into a motel room and never checked out. Investigating it reveals a bag of some mysterious pills and the word epoch written in blood on the bathroom mirror. A long discontinued LSD-like hallucinogen with euphoric effects that is straight from the 1960s. How it wound up back in Mazurna Falls is anyone's guess. But it does appear that Mel was at least dealing it. This is one concept that I'm not overly fond of. I think adding a drug element could have added some weight or 
severity to the place Emma and Kathy found themselves, as well as it being emblematic of the rot spreading beneath Mizerna Falls. But I think it also explains, or rather lampshades too much of these girls' behavior, the disassociation, the doubting reality, and the crushing anxiety isn't the result of having to wear a mask to live up to the oppressive expectations of their parents and the community, and then this alienation leads them to seek out some means of stimulation, physical or intellectual, to see value in living once again. It was literally these exact things that were documented side effects of this drug. If you pick it up at the pharmacy, it would say caution might cause you to google nihilist philosophy and call people NPCs. It's all of those things. But you also like fucking trip out dude also it puts you in the couch and then sometimes it makes you fucking impervious to projectiles but that's only sometimes morgan recognizes the location in the photo taken with emma's camera and decides to finally engage in a little detective work taking matthew to a cave with some kind of neolithic painting inside this doesn't really seem to interest him and he gets quote the creeps and leaves matthew there there goes our boy in blue america's finest i wonder what this will look like when he writes it up in the report later drove miner into the woods led him to secluded cave got real fucking spooked heard some rustling in the bushes or some shit general bad vibes so i bailed left him there to get a burger the receipt for which i will attach to this document while matthew attends one of isabel's performances he meets up with james who appears to be a regular and since he is the resident expert on Mizerna's indigenous people he's able to explain what is depicted in the cave painting it shows a supposed resurrection ritual called the mortal journey where a person is technically killed and then resuscitated in order to glimpse beyond the veil where they will hopefully reach some kind of enlightenment or perhaps even immortality, with some legends suggesting this ritual will extend the participants' lives by hundreds of years. Matthew has a rough time getting past Isabella's bodyguard to chat with her, so he returns to James sort of dejected and not sure what to do. So James is like, well, why, well, why don't you uh, like stalk her? Oh yeah, you're right. Isabella is surprisingly chill about finding Matthew snooping on her and in vague terms explains that after a car accident that killed her husband and temporarily killed her as well, Wolf, her late husband's brother, has been taking care of her financially, but doesn't expand on why she seems perpetually on edge and near terrorized all the time. It could be that she has a stalker that had the same idea as Matthew. She also explains that the melody for her song Eternal came to her in a dream she had between life and death after the accident. Before leaving, she implies that she's practically a prisoner and that Matthew shouldn't get mixed up in her life like Emma did. This plotline with Isabella is interesting in that it's maybe the part of the story that most diverges from the Twin Peaks format, if only because it's borrowing from Blue Velvet instead of Twin Peaks, which may as well exist within the same continuity. Fuck. I'm getting lightheaded, it's so fucking hot. Some shit happens, and Matthew and Winona's homeroom teacher Liz starts talking to Matthew about the death of her grandmother's younger sister. So she was murdered 40 years ago by a man named Cougar. <laughs> Yeah, 40 years ago, a man Father Barton had taken in as his ward, named Cougar, killed this person. There are uncanny similarities between that incident and what happened to Kathy and Emma. Cougar was attempting to complete the mortal journey, but wound up completing a murder-suicide, which you'd think would make any other curious party afterwards quickly surmise. Hey, I guess this thing don't work. I wouldn't say Mizerna Falls is as consistently funny as its spiritual successor, Deadly Premonition. At least as far as writing, there are a ton of fucked things that just happen in the game unintentionally. that are pretty funny. But it does find time for a number of dry little goofs, the source often being how bumbling and incompetent the antagonists proved to be, and Matthew's bewilderment concerning their goals and the ritual. He is a surprisingly grounded character, if a little dumb and bland, but he responds to most of the story like, why would anyone do this? This seems stupid. You're gonna kill yourself to gain powers? Don't you know that your actions have consequences? In a story that delves into some out there, cerebral 
themes about the nature of reality, the place of humanity in the cosmos, and how we can ascend to be more than a momentary blip in the timeline of the universe. I lost count of how many times he said something to the effect of, why do you guys even care about this? Like, just, just live your life, bro. Be young, have fun. It's actually really charming, but in this way where I can't tell if, you know, maybe that's just me misreading what kind of person he's supposed to be. I think I like him either way. Maybe that first read of him earlier was, was a little too harsh. There's a running gag where he chases someone down to interrogate or fight them. They give him some clue about where to go next, and while he's thinking about that, they, they run off. He, like, he's just a fucking meathead. Run through number two of the script uh, isn't working out too well. I uh, felt a little faint, had to take a little nap, but we're, we're back on schedule, baby. In jail, Mel gives up the name of Bonehead as the real Epoch dealer. The only reason he was caught up in it was because Kathy was too afraid to seek out the drug alone, also revealing that they were tipped off about Bonehead by Isabella. Matthew planned to ask her about that, but she's gone missing. At this point, I'd like to remind you that this is a highly abbreviated retelling, like I'm actually trying to remove parts that aren't vital, but dude, there's so much slow burn and misdirect packed into this little game. It's like trying to explain a whole season of a TV show, which is really impressive how there's still very little wasted. Pretty much every seemingly benign interaction has some implication for things to come. Isabella's disappearance begins to unravel the growing drug trade in Mizerna, leading to the discovery of stashes of Epoch. Matthew, of course, is able to deduce that all the locations that have so far been associated with the sale or storing of Epoch have been properties owned by Mel's father, Dennis, a guy who's already being cancelled for forcing his farm's workers to live in rundown shacks that rarely even have power. Thinking it a good idea to check out other places he owns? Not to Morgan, of course, because the only lead he's chasing is the connection between him oh, and a hamburger. Isabella is found and is able to finally confirm that Emma is still alive before being shot by a gangster and hospitalized. Before Dennis can be asked why all his property seem to be involved in a drug smuggling ring, word comes down that he was found dead from an apparent suicide, leaving behind a note confessing to his involvement in the resurgence of Epoch. Winona digs up a note Kathy wrote about their forest meeting, which includes a phone number belonging to the head doctor over at Gruber Hospital, Samuel. And I gotta say, kudos to the translation work, because a lot of the time, the dialogue is perfectly coherent and downright sharp sometimes. But Samuel is a character who, like, I don't, I don't know if this is an interpretation of the text, or if he's just meant to be so tactless that he sounds like a Simpsons character, like he was just given the title head doctor but secretly doesn't know anything about medicine, and it was definitely a suicide? It's not my job to determine that. All I know is that bullet blew his brains out. <laughs> Never mind, this is exactly what the guy would this expression should sound like. He admits to hitting on Kathy when he came across her, Emma, and a third person named Loretta at Bar Wolves. Loretta works and lives out of the taco truck that has been parked across the street from Matthew's place this whole goddamn time. It's, it's all coming together. What I had initially thought was just a silly piece of set dressing was actually the key to all this. Once again, I am deceived and betrayed by the disarming convenience of a taco truck. When we arrive at the planned meetup with Loretta, Winona calls to say she's going to the church to ask Father Barton some questions about Kathy and asks if he'd like to join her, but he declines. Loretta explains that Kathy was clearly terrified of her father, and the night she was attacked made an appearance at the bar where she seemed out of it in a daze and told Loretta, my father killed me. Remembering the bruising on Kathy's neck, Matthew suddenly becomes fearful for Winona and races over to the church church. Snooping around, he finds a note written by Kathy explaining that her father tried to strangle her to death and she no longer sees any reason to go on living. Father Barton walks in on this, then knocks out and ties up our boy. At least I think that's what he does. He kind of just looks like he uses telepathy to accomplish this. Once restrained, Matthew sits through Barton's extended rant about his pious daughter's fall from grace, his disappointment in her reaching its boiling point when he learns of her drug use, either 
his guilt for attempting to murder his daughter or his disappointment at not being able to successfully carry that through leads him to shoot himself. I don't know why he needed to tie up Matthew to a chair. This seems like something he could have done without traumatizing a minor. Like just leave me a note. Maybe put some plastic down while you're at it and then you tell me when you're done. Don't worry, Winona is revealed to be fine because you made it here before she even got to the church anyway. I guess Matthew didn't factor in that he has a car and she has to walk everywhere in the cold, which is probably why she called you earlier to check if you wanted to go with her. In some alternate version of this game where they pull a Resident Evil 2 and split the game between two characters, Winona would be the hard mode based on how many times you just speed past her walking around to different scenes. He probably passed her on the way up here. I'm on my way to save you. Just trying to do a little Doppler effect while swiveling in my chair. I hope that comes out good. How are you guys doing? I'm gonna try to wake myself up here. There are a handful of moments in Mizerna Falls that display this varied understanding of tension, and there's a build up to a reveal, and I, I have a feeling this game gets there entirely by cutting in line with its mimicry of television timing, blocking things out as these linear scenes in a story that is in no rush to get to the conclusion, and no doubt using a really good specific TV show as a recipe book. This is sometimes dispelled because they often write Matthew's inner thoughts as a failsafe to make sure you know exactly what something means and you've taken away the important bit of information from this clue, which I think is at odds with the Twin Peaks format. But there are moments that feel cinematic, like this one where we go to visit Cohen and find him collapsed from exhaustion. They already gave him like three lines where he felt like something bad was gonna happen in the forest And then you find his front door open and he's not around. It's kind of spooky It probably would have maintained this tension a little longer if the camera didn't sort of clip between walls and let you see his character model b Behind the door, but yeah, we can't have everything when Matthew visits him in the hospital He tries to comfort him by playing Isabella's song on the radio But this seems to unsettle Cohen we learn about his history in the military and his suspicions about Kathy and Emma that he's been hinting at since the start of the game. Back when Cougar murdered that woman while attempting the mortal journey, the town was too small and the police station too ill-equipped to handle a bizarre murder investigation. This doesn't seem like much has changed by this, besides the point. Also, don't worry about this guy, he's, he's cool. I vouch for him. Under this reasoning, the military aided in solving the case, but also took the opportunity to further some research they had already been conducting concerning life and death, performing experiments of their own that scientifically simulate the same thing the mortal journey ritual is meant to facilitate. Accessing a spiritual force the indigenous people refer to as Mazurna. When you die, Mazurna, which you could describe either as God or just the collected knowledge of the universe, falls into you, and then you are guided back to life using something called a profit necklace, much like the one found on the bear. Cohen reacts strangely to Eternal because he himself was a volunteer for what was then called Project Mazurna, killed and then shocked back to life, and during this experience he claims to have heard this exact melody. Part of me feels like he really should have disclosed this earlier, um, but also, would Morgan have gone for any of this? There's a whole scene where Matthew tries to explain the, the mortal journey to him, and he pretty much just responds with, huh. Weird. James had been given the necklace to study for his own interests, so Matthew asks for it back. And though he does give it back, he was wearing it, which is odd. And to add to this, when he removes it, he reveals an intense wound on the back of his neck that looks like an animal scratched him. They meet later at James's place to discuss what else he knows about the ritual, describing it in detail, explaining the requirement that the one being killed do so willingly by ingesting a kind of poison. Matthew gets a bit agitated when James seems to show nothing but reverence for the pursuit, even admitting he would be open to trying it if presented the opportunity. This is where you might bump up against the final requirement requirements for getting the canon ending. If you don't activate this scene and another with James, then you'll get the try again ending, which gave me a fucking panic attack because I'd been doing relatively good on time throughout my playthrough. But after James tells you to meet him at his house, he just, he didn't show up. Like I was waiting outside his house and he never came home. And as much as I enjoyed 
playing this game, if my save file was fucked at this point, I probably would have scrapped this entire video out of frustration. So I just kept reloading and trying different things, hoping something would trigger him to show up. This experimenting lasted so long, I just stopped recording footage. Because it was all just me driving around and opening doors. But I wish I could have captured this happening, because I remembered that he's always at Bar Wolves as soon as it opens. So I drove over there, and sure enough, he was just sitting in there. Keep in mind, this is well past the time he told me to get to his house now. But suddenly, when I was staring at him, as if remembering his programming, he got up and left to drive home. So I just tailed him until he wound up at the house. And then I knocked on the door and the scene triggered properly. It's the weirdest shit, like the NPC just forgot he had a job to do and he saw me and he was like, oh shit, that's right. The next day Matthew gets the call that Isabella is finally conscious and ready to talk. Morgan is busy off somewhere, so we head there alone. The hospital seems cleared out once we get there, with a trail of bodies leading to Isabella's room. I don't know if Matthew had a plan here, but he he doesn't have the most control over the situation and is almost shot until James shows up and shoots Bonehead in the arm and he runs off. Isabella says that Wolf and Bonehead are behind all of this, the drugs, the murders, and they try to cover their tracks by Epsteining Dennis. To top it all off, she reveals that Emma is alive and was being kept chained up by Wolf, but now that they're working to make all this disappear, they no longer have any reason to keep her alive. Matthew and James drive to Dennis's farm and split up. He finds Wolf and Bonehead trying to burn the place down, along with a barely lucid Emma, who's clearly been drugged this whole time and is now dependent on Epoch. Stop right there, motherfucker. Wolf and Bonehead get into a fight, blaming each other for bungling this whole operation, then shoot at each other for a while, and Wolf winds up killing him. Pew, 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 pew. F dude, I swear, if I had a gun right now, I'd be, I'd be like, pew, pew. and accidentally igniting the gasoline, so he runs off with Emma as a hostage. On the roof of the building, exhausted and riddled with bullet holes, Wolf pounds Epoch while making one last effort to kill Matthew before the cavalry arrives and a shot rings out, knocking him off the roof. Everyone high fives each other and orders pizza while Emma is driven to the hospital in an ambulance. Matthew thanks Morgan for saving his life back there, but Morgan ensures him that neither he nor any of his officers fired a shot when they arrived. Of course he didn't. That would mean he in some way contributed to this investigation. Literally the most substantial thing Morgan did was deputize a minor and then eat burgers all week. Just then they get word that Emma's ambulance didn't make it to the hospital. Even more terrifying, she's probably gonna have to pay thousands of dollars for that ride, detours included. Realizing that James hasn't been seen since they split up, he figures he must be taking her back to the tree to complete the ritual. I feel like pretty much everyone who played this had to have understood James was responsible for this after the reveal that he had the bear injury and was wearing Kathy's necklace. He also probably knew Emma the best and was in the strongest position to emotionally manipulate her and get her on board with his plan. Uh, also, last night he practically said, It would be wild if someone tried that mortal journey ritual. <laughs> Wouldn't that be crazy? Like, it could reveal an untold treasure trove of answers humanity has longed for. But but who would be that much of a loon? Not me. <laughs> Not me, man. No way. I just couldn't do it. You don't think I should do it, right? Too crazy? I don't even know why I asked. It's crazy. Unless. Matthew meets Cohen at the forest and they find Emma passed out under the tree. Oh, so good to see you out of the hospital, Cohen. This town needs you to look after them. And you know what? I look up to you. <laughs> Don't! James is whacked out on Epoch. He's looking real weird. Looking like his power levels are off the chart. He admits that he was the one who supplied the drug and synthesized it from the poison originally used to perform the ritual. He claims that Kathy and Emma had agreed to take part in the ritual, taking advantage of their seemingly matching states of ennui, but it was interrupted by the bear. After this, his goons Wolf and Bonehead went rogue and ran off with Emma. I don't really know what their plan was after after that, just selling drugs to high school kids and vibe, I guess. James demands to have the necklace back, but Matthew destroys it and the two shoot each other. <sighs> How ironic. As I lay here dying, I finally know what it feels like to be alive. Oh, he's gonna be fine. He'll be back in school next week. Well, see you later. I think in the end, 
Mizerna Falls proves to be a very tightly woven and logical story that has a sensible answer for nearly everything, and there is certainly a satisfaction that comes in seeing a puzzle box slowly unfurl, but the story's unwillingness to just let certain things live in abstraction betrays something to me. A Lynchian tenet favoring mystery over psychology is a core part of Twin Peaks that I would consider more important to an homage than recreating scenes and characters whole cloth. So despite there being a lot there, the game's connection to that show feels largely aesthetic, taking things that look and sound like it, chipping away the dreamlike qualities until it's down to an easily digestible caper. The supernatural is suggested throughout, but it's usually paired with what feels like these staunchly atheistic responses, like isn't this enough? Why would you need to dream up fairy tales to make life more bearable? By the end, it feels like a definitive no to the supernatural question. In the final scene, James no longer considers himself human, and even takes on this bizarre rictus grin, claiming that death is merely a disease waiting to be cured, but this is easily explained as a narcotic-induced delusion of grandeur. I'm curious if this is merely an artistic choice, a way of maintaining some originality by rewriting the supernatural parts of Twin Peaks to have logical answers, or if those parts of the show just didn't agree with the writer. Like when they were watching the show, every time they cut to the red room or something, he was like, ah, oh, Jesus, they're doing all that backwards talking shit again. Why don't you get back to the town? What are all the kids doing? How's Donna? We don't ever learn if the mortal journey does indeed call upon Mizerna, or if any of the metaphysical aspects have any truth beyond some mildly interesting coincidences. What ultimately wins out is Matthew and Winona's YOLO ethos, living the life you have now and not becoming occupied with the thought of what comes after. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a secondary spoiler warning for all Twin Peaks related media. This includes seasons 1 and 2, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, Twin Peaks The Missing Pieces, and Twin Peaks The Return. And uh, just to play it safe because I think I, I, I just say the ending right at the start of this, uh, <laughs> spoilers for Deadly Premonition as well. It's not a big part of it, I just, it's, I just casually uh, ruin it right at the start. If you have any interest in experiencing this charming mindfuck of a franchise, I'm probably gonna spoil substantial parts of it since, unlike Deadly Premonition, which mainly stuck to borrowing concepts and character archetypes and remixing them, Mazerna Falls does seem to liberally scoop up whatever it can from that world, plot points included. I recommend consuming all that media I, either choice you make here. It's sort of the uh, Rosetta Stone for many great things and worth experiencing. Deadly premonitions seem to hold more admiration for that other half of Twin Peaks, the one steeped in esoteric imagery, Tibetan mysticism, and Lynchian dream logic, where characters cross paths in each other's nightmares, extra-dimensional weirdos eat cream corn made of sorrow, and people turn into doorknobs, and wanted, it seems, to tell a story using those ideas. I was thinking about how Mazurna Falls kept repeating plot points I've seen, but that none of them really retained the same energy, and I've decided I think it's because Twin Peaks was sort of about creating a format or a place of comfort and then breaking it, intentionally disrupting the idea you held of what kind of story this was going to be. I mean, every piece of Twin Peaks, when you think about it, ends on what feels like the bad ending. I mean, in a, in a video game sense. It's not illogical or poorly written. It's a fail state. Moments like, I haven't brushed my teeth yet, and what year is it, suggest you missed something and fucked up and who knows if we'll ever have a shot at fixing it. For a split second, I thought maybe they would retain some piece of this by going through with killing Matthew, but they play it safe, keeping everyone alive and having the town return to business as usual. If anything, it's more like Blue Velvet in that it almost condescendingly pretends that nothing happened, but you know what's bubbling beneath the surface of this fucked up world. I'm on to you, Fireman. Wait a second, Fireman? The Fireman. I gotta write this shit down. There are many instances where the ideas of both games intersect. Mizerna Falls and Greenvale both have a plotline concerning a military experiment slash war crime occurring in the 1950s, which I find interesting because I can't tell if that is some extrapolation of Project Blue Book being worked into the Twin Peaks lore, or if they both just decided that would be an appropriate and fun thing to include in what is already a sort of anachronistically 50s style setting. It's then doubly strange that decades later, 
when Twin Peaks came back, they also wound up doing a flashback sequence, which included a depiction of the first atomic bomb test, as if the central conflict in all three properties began when their respective darkness was birthed in the 1950s. There's some shared imagery, like a blonde victim laid out under a massive tree in some ritualistic fashion, but it's in this game's second half that you really see how much deadly premonition borrowed from the Mizerna Falls plot structure in addition to all the Twin Peaks stuff. Mainly this whole bit where you think you've fingered the game's main antagonist, who makes a last ditch effort to survive the confrontation by downing a handful of the illicit substance at the periphery of the case. The protagonist's love interest, injured, is put in a car meant to take her to safety, but is unknowingly handed over to the true enemy, who does not take her to the hospital and instead completes whatever evil plan they had. Obviously, Mizerna Falls does not have a coop or York placeholder. I couldn't definitively say who exactly inspired Matthew, but based on a few plot points, I'd describe him as some kind of mashup between James Hurley from Twin Peaks and Jeffrey from Blue Velvet. An inquisitive student that gets mixed up in all manner of dangerous and dark situations. He kinda looks like Harold, though, I think. You know, in that he's not very memorable. <laughs> like, ah, come on, I'm kidding. I think, I don't remember. With Winona being pretty clearly Donna, Laura Palmer and Ronette Pulaski are reworked as Emma and Kathy, but slightly reversed and bleeding into each other, as Emma winds up being the one found alive, but both have separate experiences that all wind up mirroring Laura's in the film Fire Walk With Me. In that way, they get to have Laura be murdered, but also save her. In Twin Peaks, James is one of many secret relationships Laura fosters, and Donna is her best friend. But their relationship is strained due to Laura's substantially more wild lifestyle. Mazurna Falls often seems to do a lot of pearl clutching about the story's more mature elements, and winds up clumsily omitting nearly any mention of romance or sexuality from the story, and really tries to distance its main characters from getting involved involved in salacious acts. But there is enough to imply that the same kind of thing is happening. Matthew and Winona are friends with Emma, and it's implied that Emma has feelings for Matthew. In Twin Peaks, one of the last nights Donna and Laura shared together involved Donna following Laura out of concern and curiosity to a trashy bar and attempting to live as she does and better understand her, unaware that her life involved hard drug use and working for a Canadian brothel. The night ends when Laura is upset by seeing Donna heading down the same self-destructive path as her. One of the last nights when Nona and Emma were together, the two of them went to Bar Wolves. Emma gets drunk, which horrifies Winona, and after some creepy guy won't leave them alone, they leave the bar, with Emma remarking that this is no place for girls like you. Winona also mentions Emma asking to reaffirm that they are friends and that she'd be upset if she was gone, which imparts some guilt for not recognizing that as a cry for help. Much like a scene in Fire Walk With Me, where Laura asks Donna to reaffirm that she's her best friend. Also worth noting that Laura endured an absurd amount of suffering, but developed this detached persona to deal with it appearing unassuming to many people in Twin Peaks, but to the people close to her, it was clear that she shouldered a great deal, expressed in scenes like Bobby disrupting her funeral and blaming the town itself for her death. This came as a shock to most people. She was still a homecoming queen, she still volunteered at a Meals on Wheels program, bringing food to the elderly. These sorts of things are seen in Emma, and even Morgan had to have it explained to him that Emma could have possibly had depression. Hang on, like she was sad but pretending like she wouldn't can you do that i like how i've not kept anything close to a consistent voice for this guy is she kept up appearances even helping out barbara the kooky old chain smoking lady that stays at the hospital the night before laura dies james is one of the last people to see her and she behaves strangely leaving him with some cryptic final words suggesting neither he nor donna truly know who she is and that his laura is long gone Mizerna falls is also in a way accidentally prescient of the role disassociation and identity confusion would play in twin peaks once it returned they sort of recontextualize laura's struggle with her supernatural abuser and the self-destructive persona 
she creates, as Emma having some literal drug-induced crisis, doubting the nature of reality as though she's sleepwalking through a simulation or something, not knowing that the show would eventually incorporate characters that are manufactured doubles who bear the burden of knowing they aren't the original person, and characters who literally aren't in the timeline or dimensional space they're meant to be in. That night, Laura also paid a visit to Bobby, another boy she had wrapped around her finger, but was mostly using him to have steady access to drugs. Bobby also maintained a contentious secret relationship with Shelly, who worked at the Double R Diner. In Mazurna Falls, Matthew recounts that the night before Emma's disappearance and Kathy's death, Emma was behaving strangely, seeming distant, and preferring to be left alone. She'd later go see Mel to get Epoch. Mel had unrequited feelings for her and wound up being strictly her dealer, and also has a contentious relationship with Lorraine, who works at Haynes Diner. Both Bobby and Mel also owe a great deal of money to a dangerous criminal, and they concoct a scheme to work up the money for it. Following Laura's death, James and Donna launch their own investigation to find out how this happened to someone they both care about so deeply, unraveling the secret history of Laura Palmer, and as a result, growing closer and dependent on one another for comfort, and much the same could be said for Matthew and Winona. I do think this makes less sense with Emma still being alive, because they try to transfer the impact of her death to Kathy's character, who's somebody neither of them actually knew or have a connection with. This investigation reveals, among many things, strange petroglyphs with supernatural implications in a forest cave at the town's outskirts, a drug smuggling ring, and most shockingly, the revelation that Kathy was murdered by her emotionally abusive father, making Barton a reflection of Leland, though a Leland possessed by some kind of crazed religious rage and not a possessing spirit. He even admits to spying on Emma and Kathy while they were getting high in their motel room, which sounds a lot like the scene in Fire Walk With Me, when Leland backs out of the four-way he had planned with Laura Ronette and Teresa Banks. The line, My father killed me, is repeated verbatim. My father killed me. But then again, I don't know how many ways there are to verbalize that your father killed you. I mean, the fact that my father would do anything with me is, is really exciting, so... I guess you could word it a little bit more cheerfully if, if, if you felt similarly. There is a lot of the movie in this game, which is interesting because it wasn't regarded highly when it came out. I mean, I think it's, it's a beautifully made film centered around a truly fearless performance, and the show was a big deal, especially in Japan, but a lot of casual Twin Peaks fans were disappointed by it, in part because it's sort of an endurance test of misery, but also because it didn't fully address the cliffhanger the show was initially left Left with when it was cancelled. We didn't get to learn, how is Annie? Judging by her appearance in the movie, she's having her own kind of catatonic Rick and Morty adventure through the Peaks verse. but Mazurna displays a great deal of admiration for it, even in the way it paces it out across a week where Fire Walk With Me takes a week counting down to Laura's death. There are a bunch of characters in Mazurna Falls that vaguely stand in for or reference a character in Twin Peaks, one of them being Emma's mother Sarah, who has a lot in common with Sarah Palmer. Uh, like her name and her propensity to scream at random intervals, but more importantly she lives in a house that seems to be modeled after the actual Palmer house, down to the iconic staircase with the fan at the top. Some other locations bear an uncanny likeness to places in Twin Peaks, like the police station with the green sign and gold lettering. It also has a remarkably similar layout, including Mary Lou, who doesn't get a lot of screen time but is given at least one scene to demonstrate that she is every bit as eccentric as Lucy. There's also the school with that single red line painted across the walls. And I, I could continue down this path, but those are probably the interesting ones. I'm hoping. The rest are clear but not significant. You know, a missing diary, a shot of a hanging street light, damn fine burgers. A damn fine cup of coffee. Uh, maybe Dennis is like Ben Horn? I don't know. I, I, I don't think I've ever been this physically drained making a fucking recording. As if this wasn't enough, Blue Velvet is woven into this plot by putting Matthew in very similar circumstances as Jeffrey. In that movie, Kyle MacLachlan's character is overcome with curiosity when a severed ear he found is said to be linked to a lounge singer named Dorothy, a woman who is terrorized by a group of gangsters that are holding her husband and son hostage. His first order of business is breaking into her home, which results in them developing a sadomasochist 
masochistic relationship. In Mazurna Falls, Matthew follows a lead that brings him to the lounge singer Isabella, whose name is in reference to the actress who plays Dorothy, Isabella Rossellini. She's also given a similar dress and vintage microphone. He ends up snooping on her and breaking into her home, learning that she is being terrorized by a group of gangsters that want her to make money for the local bar and help them sell Epoch. Dorothy and Isabella also have signature songs that people show up for. The song that gives Blue Velvet its title and eternal. There's a little moment of teasing something more between the two when she decides to take a shower after her bodyguard knocks him out, and even Donna, fuck, uh, Winona has a line that's like, huh, seems like you two are real friendly. But again, that would be acknowledging some of the more mm, unbecoming parts of David Lynch's films. The more, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a third ingredient I've been putting off addressing that the film buffs out there have no doubt already noticed. Where are my film school heads at? No, it's not Battleship Potemkin. <laughs> no, it's not Rear Window. Keep guessing. It's not the Seventh Seal. It's not Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> On the waterfront the fuck out of here. You may have noticed that Morgan's character portrait bears a striking resemblance to Sergeant Powell from Die Hard. Adding to that, the translation names the hospital Gruber Hospital, perhaps in reference to the villain that Alan Rickman plays in that film. But the in-game text says Grauver Hospital, which might just be like, you know, another kind of phonetic oopsie. And, and they were going for Gruber. This, this isn't a stretch, right? <laughs> this one. All right, this is some real rabbit hole shit. So Morgan's deputy is named Hudson Rang, like another Bruce Willis vehicle. Hudson Hawk, Hawk, Tommy Hawk Hill, the deputy at the Twin Peaks police station. Rang, Rango, Rango, Johnny Depp, Hunter S. Thompson, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72, which according to the book, The Secret History of Twin Peaks is Hawk's favorite book. That's right, give me a minute and I'll tie this all back into Hollywood elites harvesting adrenochrome. Oh, it was Hudson Lang. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Obviously, it's far from original and does not approach the story it's imitating in complexity, intrigue, or beauty. Not that I assumed it would be able to, but I was certainly engaged by the mostly grounded and mostly solid mystery at the heart of Mizerna Falls, which is not an experience I've had with a PS1 game. Not to say there aren't PS1 games with good stories, but I can't think of another game that attempted anything like this one without being set in some kind of post-industrial world ravaged by mega corporations, you know, nobody's trying to stop a lady from blowing up everyone on the planet, and only a New York City cop can take her downtown. It's just some kids trying to find their missing friend because the cops aren't doing shit. If there is one substantial thing I don't like about it, it's that it's too safe. Something like, I don't know, I'll just pick something at random. Twin Peaks is a show that depicts characters with an ambiguous character alignment. They will make bad decisions, hurt other people. Sometimes they're redeemed, sometimes they aren't. But everyone in Mazurna Falls is sticking to the two-sentence description they get in the manual. The story seems to want to address these mature themes like depression, drug abuse, mental illness, crime rings, and... <sighs> sex. But it recoils from it at nearly every turn, and there is a stark absence of the surreal and creepy parts of that show. I could absolutely uh, go ham, lobbing criticisms at the story of Mazurna Falls, but part of me feels like it, it wouldn't do any good comparing it to the landscape of video game storytelling because it's such a strange outlier, and it actually does nail a lot about TV writing, if anything, and it understands to some degree tension, foreshadowing, and things like that. This could not have been an easy thing to write and create in the time it takes most modern games to produce a, a teaser trailer with no gameplay. The novelty of its gameplay aside, I think it is its story that makes the experience worth it. For both the charm of seeing something nostalgic, rendered in itself a nostalgic era of games, and for the unique things it contributes to that. And also just the scope and ambition behind it. In a time when games often consisted of inventive but similar fantasy worlds with badass lead characters to save them, some guy that just liked small towns in North America and a cancelled TV show threw his hat in the ring, then dusted it off and headed for the mountains. Truly the greatest way Mizerna Falls follows in the footsteps of Twin Peaks uh, is that it, it took a while for the world to be ready for it.
well. Mazurna Falls touts a sizable map with a decent amount of detail and character models moving through scheduled lives, but that's kind of where the awe in it stops because there is surprisingly little to do within it and you are required to follow a strict path to experience what is there. It is absolutely a trip seeing this oddity in action, but I feel like just because you attempted this leap earlier than some doesn't mean you necessarily did much to justify it. There isn't much in the way of enjoyable or memorable gameplay, but that's not to say I couldn't find charm in how they attempted to add interactivity to something so narratively complicated. It's also just, you know, not my taste. There are a lot of games like this that border on being a visual novel, but just get away with not being labeled that because of one or two sort of mini-game elements, and honestly this is not something I'm a big fan of. Nothing against it. More power to you if you like these kinds of games. Uh, don't mean to judge anybody who likes them, yeah, but they suck and I hate them and they should be deleted. This game takes place across seven in-game days, and unless you're in dialogue, time is always moving forward with an hour passing and about five real life minutes. Each day contains a series of scripted scenes that you can trigger by entering where they take place within a slim window of time. This is absolutely where the main gimmick of the game rapidly falls apart. It's not even as though you have anything involved to do in that time. Most of your time will be spent driving around or looking at things. Every once in a while you might have to fight someone or participate in a quick time sequence, but making it everywhere on time is enough of a challenge that I was in a near constant state of panic throughout my playthrough, which is weird when I think about it because it may as well be, you know, a walking simulator or a visual novel. And yet I was fucking pouring sweat, constantly looking back at the clock, my nose was bleeding, at a certain point one of my arms went numb. Don't worry, it wasn't the bad one. Which one's bad? I should add that you're only panicking when you know you need to be somewhere. The other side of the coin is just waiting, knowing you don't have enough time to drive home, sleep, and then drive back, so you just have to fucking post up outside the bar, waiting for it to open, even though everyone seems to be able to go in just fine before you, but no! I gotta wait outside. And in real life, I gotta wait here, just sitting here like an idiot, holding a controller, alone with my thoughts, which I hate. You're an idiot! I hate that shit. So yeah, I make no claims of being a master gamer or even a competent one, but based on having played at least a game, I can say this whole system is simply not fair, and the game is sorely lacking some kind of objective list or indication of when something significant is taking place, especially if it's a thing that locks you out of the true ending. There are so many ways you can just bone yourself out of experiencing plot, and even when you're following a guide, there is very little time or reason to spend exploring Mazurna Falls. One or two of the nights do end kind of early, so you have some time to yourself, but aside from a Fight Club minigame that takes place in the park, everything's closed, and I didn't stumble on anything else interesting. I guess it's not all that surprising, I mean, it's a marvel that there is even this much openly explorable space on a PlayStation game, and just traversing it can often cause substantial lag, so why would I expect them to fill it with a bunch of gratuitous functionality and detail? I really wanted to check out Jeff Brown steakhouse. I bet you you could get a real sloppy steak in there. Speaking of food, it's kind of funny that Mazurna Falls aspired to something Deadly Premonition actually had time to implement, albeit poorly. You can order food or coffee from a handful of places, but there's no effect or purpose for this. It seems to be entirely a vestigial function that was never given significance. But it's not just food, it's more money that is also a shadow of a mechanic. Dialogue and some menus seem to acknowledge money like it isn't a purely scripted thing you actually never have to think about. Everything might as well be free. Gas certainly is. And you'd think you'd never need it because it's a small town and it's not like you're driving cross country. You're just going down the block to the community place. You know, I admit there's a part of me that wishes the game leaned into the creepier parts of Twin Peaks with the talking backwards and the screaming at me and the whoa look out but unintentionally I, I think I did get that since this game is so graphically fucked it's practically a near constant creepypasta cryptids and ghosts all over this fella <laughs> yeah. did you see that if you want to save the game, you can head back to Matthew's place and take a nap, but doing so moves time forward either an hour or five hours. Though for certain situations where you can die, they will sometimes give you a merciful quick save, so you don't have to replay hours of this game to get back to a challenge that you'll just fuck up again. Some of these, like when this dog chases you out of the junkyard, are just complete bullshit. <laughs>
<laughs> and if you somehow manage to magically understand this within three tries, you're, then your brain should be studied for science because you're a genius and probably the chosen one in some culture's prophecy. The fighting segments are sluggish and simple, and most of them can be won by just backing up while kicking. I guess it's more intimidating than my strategy, backing up against a wall, sobbing hysterically until they get close and the Oscar goes too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Ah, come on, come on. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Come on. I do appreciate the variation in the gameplay and the fact that you're often the one deciding to throw the first punch in an argument. Most of the time when they ask you for your input in a cutscene, it might change some slight detail, but the outcome is, is usually the same. I like how low tech your cell phone is. You actually have to either memorize phone numbers or consult your address book to get the combo of buttons that make up a phone number. Real helpful in tracking down certain characters, especially Morgan, who seemed to perpetually be anywhere but his fucking office. Nobody else seems to have a cell phone, so Mary Lou will just tell you where he was headed, but he might be leaving wherever he was. You never know. So I want to give the game credit and not have this section be solely criticism. It's just that there's a lot to be improved, and it constantly dances back and forth across the line between innovative and broken. Why can you enter every bathroom in town, but you can't even bust a piss? Probably the most consistently bothersome part of the gameplay is something that affects all movement on foot or behind the wheel, and that's the brutal collision detection. Matthew is already controlled like a tank in molasses, so it can get pretty frustrating when you continuously graze the edge of a corner or a doorway and get stuck and have to rock yourself out of it. In a game where you gotta be everywhere early, it's the worst feeling being slowed down by something that is not your fault. There were some bugs I ran across that I have to imagine are the result of emulation and couldn't possibly be something that just happened on a console, but sometimes I'd appear to drive faster than the game could process its draw distance, and it would just give up so I'd careen off into an unrendered purgatory and flip upside down. Is this the White Lodge? Sometimes events wouldn't complete if you didn't complete it exactly how it wanted you to. Like in this segment where you have to tail this guy back to his apartment, and I, I retried it enough times to know the path he took, so I kind of just waited for him to get there on his own. And because I didn't go through the whole business of creeping forward and hiding, he just stops at the door and never goes in. <laughs> I'm the door now. Hell yeah, dude. I love getting a new video game. Hmm? Fuck. Uh, hello? You remember when we danced to the <laughs> That's... You know, the more I stare at it, it is kinda exceptionally low quality. I think it's just been a while since I've played a PlayStation game that I just thought, yeah, I, I guess they all look like this. But then I looked up Tomb Raider and, and Soul Reaver and Silent Hill, and in comparison, this is a real simple, blocky looking game. It's not without its charm, of course. I do like the attention to detail in certain scenes, like the forest near the waterfall, and how it looks when it snows at night. The day-night cycle is pretty well depicted occasionally, creating some moody lighting. It's certainly capable of creating an atmosphere. It just doesn't hold on to it for long periods of time. But I do get a kick out of this era of graphics. I like how the characters' faces sort of bend and shift as they move around, like they just drink a pot juice potion or some shit. Matthew's hands are just like little nubs. <laughs> like what, what, what can you grab onto with those? Only small things I bet. I am sorry, I've never written a script this long. What, what the fuck was that? I have no reference for how this game runs on a console, but my playthrough consistently showed off a variety of strange visual glitches, like characters and cars appearing in the sky or just blinking into existence out of nowhere. One time while I was mourning the death of Kathy, a little car drove by. He just, he's just on his way wherever he's going. Bye bye thanks for visiting, tiny car. I love you, tiny car. I'll miss you. On more than one occasion, the character Matthew is supposed to be talking to in a cutscene just doesn't load in. So he looks like a psycho just having a one-sided conversation with himself. Did you see Morgan? That's something at least. The threat of something like this happening is, is always going to be looming. And then sometimes it won't happen for a while and you'll let your guard down and then... Shh. 
shit. Bro! This game has kind of a bland MIDI soundtrack that I got sick of pretty quickly. It doesn't feel like the most lovingly made score, and many tracks can sound like the demo option on a cheap keyboard. All of it is serviceable enough, sounds mysterious, but you're just, you're really gonna hear it a lot. It's like Deadly Premonition, but if the soundtrack was also boring on top of being overbearing and repetitive. Some of the incidental music and the tracks used in the opening cutscene are pretty good, and it's a shame they didn't make more in that vein. Police believe she was attacked by a bear. That cutscene is also the only spoken dialogue in the game, aside from the vocals in Eternal, the song that shows up a few times and has some narrative significance. The writing is a little rough, with lyrics that sound a bit like the result of Google Translate. But when you consider its origin within the story, there is this mildly haunting quality to it. And it's got some pretty instrumentation as well. Audio in general seems like it wasn't considered that much, probably outsourced, or was just what took the most significant hit due to time or budget constraints, or maybe just space constraints. From reading about the process of translating this game, it sounds like the disc was pretty much stuffed to the gills, so even editing the script to include more text characters was pushing it too far. I guess I wasn't considering the possibility that some of the things that seemed unfinished are that way because otherwise it wouldn't fit on a single disc. I think this cool crow probably took up too much data. I mean, it, it's a very cool, it's very good crow. You gonna give me a little caw? No, oh, I guess not. <laughs> Mizerna Falls is an interesting footnote and stepping stone in the development of life simulation in video games, but that's not really the part that made me want to play it. I think in a lot of ways it was the mystique, the idea of an ambitious Twin Peaks inspired PS1 game that never made it to my neck of the woods. I'm really glad I got to experience it. It feels like a surreal privilege that I would just learn about this anomalous title and then months later get to play it in English. I don't know what it is specifically that drives me to more ardently seek out media inspired by Twin Peaks over other things I appreciate like X-Files. I think maybe because Twin Peaks was something taken before its time that has a whole cancel lifespan both on TV and in film that we'll never actually get to see. X-Files got 11 seasons, two spin-offs, two movies, two games, books, comics, and even though there is plenty left unresolved with its mythology, you can't say it didn't have a fair shot. Twin Peaks was this fleeting moment that you have to wring other media out to feel again, and I'm not strong enough to avoid games like this one. There are certainly parts of this game I enjoyed and found engaging or remarkable, mostly its impressive array of crisscrossing characters and scenes that build a solid little mystery, but the prevailing feeling was that this was clearly an idea that they did not have the resources to see through as imagined, leaving it in a half-realized and half-stable condition. On top of that, for such a narrative-focused game, it makes experiencing all of its story so difficult it's disheartening unless you follow step-by-step -step instructions, and even then you'd find yourself questioning why you'd come up with the idea to do half of this shit on your own. Uh, as an example, at one point the guide tells you, alright, buy a lighter now because you're gonna want one later. This is because way later you'll find yourself in a dark ventilation shaft and you'll need the lighter to navigate, but nothing really foreshadows the need for that and it's not as if you get it from a shop character where that there's always an option to buy it from a menu. It just kind of assumes you talked to this guy on a certain day and if you get to that moment where you need it and you don't have it, it's just too late. The shops are closed, you can't really do anything about it. It just seems full of these little moments that are working to get you to start the whole game over again. And this is absolutely not a game that holds replay value for me. Maybe if I played it in 1998, when this was the only game I'd be playing for a while, I'm sure, I'm sure there wasn't many options in 1998. Ooh, well... 
It's, uh, it's not the worst. There is enough of what I was looking for to carry me through the experience, but I couldn't see myself revisiting it, mostly because it's just not a style of gameplay that I find interesting, even when it was working as intended. What I enjoyed the most was picking apart the story and trying to get into the mind of the dev team and understand what parts of this game's inspiration really resonated with them. I'm not gonna front like I'm not a fan of pointing at my monitor and saying, I remember that. I remember when they held that town meeting to warn everyone there might be a killer on the loose, which I'm beginning to think may be a truly pathetic reason to play a 16 hour game, but it, it can't be more pathetic than uh, writing an hour plus video about it. Hey, that's the end of the video. Thanks so much for watching uh, all or some of it or just falling asleep to it. As you could probably tell from my 100th video, I thought I'd just go uh, overboard with something painfully self-indulgent. And I thank you for allowing me to do that. Were it not for my patrons and subscribers, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to devote almost a, a complete month to making an elaborate excuse to talk about Twin Peaks. I I'm endlessly grateful that I'm allowed to do that and not die destitute and disease-ridden afterward. I, I, I hope I can subsist long enough to do this several times over and that it'll take you know far less time now to get to video 200 anyway uh thanks so much for your support or for just being along for the ride feel free to like comment subscribe follow me on twitter join my discord uh i'll probably put up merch soon with like the uh the, the new logo and shit on it uh and and that's that's all yeah uh, let's do some names. An extra thanks to Ailing Uncle, two password for kids, a guy in a jacket, Alexander Smith, Alexander Sundin, Andre Perkins, Bayard Brown, Ben Carnell, Pizza Shift, Charles Marr, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor 86, Dos Days, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Gody McGork, Jacob Sewers, Jay, Jay Alamine, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Karen Mayville, Ken Dog, Marcus Chani, Nekot the Brave, News Time, Octo, Oyster. Resurrection, Ruibi Sumet, Salvatore Tosti, Sammy! <coughs> Sammy! Oh, Sammy. Stuka Bliat, this deal is getting better all the time. Turts, Wayne Bristol, Whip It Out, Darken Streams Fan, Ava Nerve, Giraffa, Jesse Briscoe, A Hanging Chad, Brozoof Jones, Donut Stalker, Dubs, High Food Court, Ishanji, Mad Monty 98, Nafis Hook, Ophelia Fishwife, Patera Bach, P. Dizzle, Persian Air, Philip Woolley, Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Sergei Voronsov, Saab Akaduka, Technica, Wyatt Norton, About Blank, Alistair Stewart, Alexander Olbrick, Alexander Schultz, Andrew Light, Andy Krieger, Big Honk, Bishy93, Brendan McFadden, Brett Weaver, Colby, Dan Cullen, Daniel Streb, David Fromke, David Harpstrite, Dazed Clockwork, Example Username, Faith Nowlin, Fickle Pickle Jar, Haley Bobella, Hitoshi San, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, James Bloom, James Hashimoto, Jaron Kemp, Jordan Balzano, M, Mandalore Gaming, MCR, Miles Phillips, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Timmins, Nork426, Oliver Marshall, Ombud, Opichi Costra, PWs, Quinn McElroy, Robert, Roland, Simon, Spooky, Stever, Swood Operator, Teeth, the Teeth, 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 Travis Houston, Tyler Robinson, Four Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, AI, Alas Rat Gunk, Alec Dye, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Kalganov, Aratek, Eris Alessandrakis, Arminius J, Arshes Knight, Aubrey, Austin Scott, Beardicus, Ben Saxon, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Binary Vision, Bindle, Boris Rombolt, Brandon Naftal, Byron Callan, Calavera, Callum May, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Colin Boyd, Colton Rowe, Kamihog, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Crispy, DS Carmen, Delaminek, Dan Richardson, Daniel Person, Dark Cloud 402, David Quinn, David Offord, Declan J. Keen, Der Commissar, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Doxapine, Dre City, Dreadhead, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Enzo, Ursandro, Fazy, Fix My Brain, Fred Gryson, Greg Buchol, Greg McKee, Grim You Can Do This, it's pronounced Blatharus, Blatharus, what have I been saying? Blatharus? Blatharus. I understand it is now spelled out phonetically for me, but I'm still unsure if I said it correctly. Homeboy Dirtbag, INTJ loves her INTP, Evo Zap, Jay Marshall, James Young, Jared Siri, Jean-Philippe Malouin, Jessica, Joe Jameson, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, J Raptor, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Keith Pitt, Chris Odie, KS, League of Struggle, 
Leland Miliokis, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Marcelo Camargo. Am I becoming white? Uh, Matt Bastard, Megan Carmody, Micah J. Best, Michael, Michael King, Michael Monstry, Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Moonpix, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Q-Chan, Nameless, Nicholas Nelson, Nick Hill, Nikita Denisov, Nuan Sonar, Olympus 3DX, Omar Eid, Otter Soldier, Papa Perk, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Roy Gendron, Skos 117, Scott Aldridge, Sean, Sean Clausen, Sergey Vidovin, Smokey Jefferson, Sonata Fanatica, Spider, Steinuel, Steve, Drahinka Redenkovich, Sweet Pete, Pretty Neat, Out in the Street. Right on the beat. Wicka wicka word. <laughs> Fucker. Sydney Steverson, T Stoney, Terranism, The Mighty Noob, The Sleepiest Sarah, Tino Richter, Totally Not a Mimic, Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler F, Tyler Long, Vargar, Vivitis, Volpix Chick, Ween Supreme, Xanax OD Grindcore Lover, Ya Boy Nikki G, Yak Spiker, Eves Yang, Zachariah I Am, Zdenek Benez, Zin, Zubertuber, Arset Markusen, A Perfectly Normal Human and Definitely Not a Dog That Learned How to Use a Computer. AJ Leroy, AL Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, Adolency, Adrian Facci, Adventure Game Geek, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsonal, Anna Emilia, Anthony Daniel, Austin Mathis, Baker, Big Hubert, Brad, Brian Sanson, B. Selpy, Kanum, Kaz, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, David Moreau, Dylan, Drenched, Drunk Taco, Fabulous Freckles, Gamesbrit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Ghost LPs, Half Asian Viking, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Hinchis, Homeboy Dirtbag, Huai Li, Nacio de Guglielmi, IP68, Isabella Stoner, Jeep Pete, Wait, what? Not in the backseat? Joe Reynolds, Johan Kavand, Jonathan Becker, Jonathanis Eddy, Josh B, Yoni Niamela, Wabuktis, Kakun, Kevin Thurber, Krampig Newt, Laz Lowe, Lucas, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Melly, Melon, Miguel Amaro, Myargar, Nachdib, Nicholas Monroe, Niles Crane 19, Odd One Indeed, Okay Cat Dad. I don't think that inflection was implied, but. Okay, Cat Dad. <laughs> Pedro Costum, Phony Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, QTP2T, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Rotten Hams, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Schluff, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sir Tristan, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Sir Alohomora, Slava Saknienko, Slavic Dreams, Snow Lame, Solar Box, Stephen Laflame, Sven Grell, Sinoise, Sir Apprise, Tatami Guy, Test Dunn, The Becker Sattler Clan, The Gaming Beehive, Little B, The Real Call L, The Voyant Claire, The Magnificent Spud, Timothy, Uncle Dozer TV, Val Halverson, Valinora, Venetian Red, Vincent Cronin, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Your Patron, Yuko Vallis, Zachary Scharf, ZJ, One Iserlo, A Gallon of PCP, R R P Trevor, Alberto Virhadas Ferreira, Alex Army Bull, Alex U, Allegory, Anna Trans Rights Exo, Andre Kurenkov, Anthony H, Astro Shepherd, Azroy, Bertigan, Bertie Bertig, Big Death Energy, Bitmatter, Bloodworth, Bimbizzle, Bo, Bobson Jr., Boyi, Bones Malones, Brandon Shock, Bubblegum Kirapop, Buckaroo, Cabbage. Cam, Chalabard, Chef Toker, Chonko Ronko, Chris Barb, Cinna Selena, Cloyster 56, CMG161, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Danny D, Dantec K3, David Badzinski, Dead Alewives, Damar, Dezu, Deveith Faust, Dust Sucker, Edmo Filo, Edward McQuinn, Edward Wheeler, Eggs McOmelet, 82 Pedro, Emilio Hansen, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leong, Eric Lawn, Eugene Balder, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Frank, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Franz, Gianni Matragrano, Gideon Joubert, Guy, H.L. Longboy, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Haimo Statman, Hoffleran, I Fa Down, Ian, Ian Baranek, Ikifu, Incorrect Beans, Inky, Inside My Strange Place, Jacob Hanley, Jacob Gardner, Jalcor, James Lambert, J Dog 3433, Jick Magger, John Adams, John Brumley, John Kamich, John Stone, Josh Hessler, Joshua Khan, Joshua McLarnan, Joshua Stewart, Justavian, Caliphas, Casey Ghoul, Kimia, Curano, Kyle Williams, Lefazar, Laura Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinn Whalen, Low C, Lucas Mendel, Luke Gazaway, Lynn Lovett, Magno 
Dick, Malafrena, Manu Weidman, Mara Alina, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowwood, Mi Juin, Metal Crew, Michael B, Mike McMuscles, Mikey Tambourine, Mojave Jade, Moral, Mungo Jerry, Nagru, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Negative Creep, Nick Johnson, Octo, Pagan Butler, Peach, Pentagon Black, Perennial Astronaut, Farceface, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Piotr Skubawa, Poet Russell, Pommy, Popeye Bark, Prod Mage, Putty God, QL2040, Rachel Rose, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, Razzle Dazzle B13, Red, Redo KB, I think, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Ren, Ruben, Robert Chernovsky, Robert McMahon, Robert Scotland, Roosevelt Hoover IV, Ross Carmona, Ryan Malone, Saint, Sam Fuller, Samich, Sammy 3D, Sarah Denman, Scott Valine, Sean Bradford, Sean Lovett, Sean Tiva, Snail85, Someone Finally Pays Me, Stanislav, Summerstorm, Sweet Easy, Tayano Sandman, That One Guy, That Taffer, This Sid 4, Ooh, I can already tell I'm gonna fuck this up, Thomas Kaldikowry. Well, if, if you're there in the next month, f feel free to spell that phonetically. Thyrork, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Saurus, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Van the Cheesen, Ve, Viet Do, Vigo Love, Vincent Liu, Vinculus, Vlad M, Vukrulez, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Water Under Rock, Webgoth, Who Done It, Widukine, Will M, William Riker, Walric, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yasarian, Yuki Cyan, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Brake, and Ziklau for being a patron. Ooh, I appreciate y'all so much. This needlessly stupidly long video is in is, is a monument to what is possible with your health. Maybe I shouldn't say that. What I mean is, I'm allowed to do things that are are enjoyable and fun to make be, uh, because of you. And uh, I appreciate that more than anything. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're uh, hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying goth. Hope you're staying gaming. Hundred years of goth gamer nation. Hundred years, baby. It's hot. <laughs>